Today we're here with Peter to hear how God has led him on his journey and managed to turn a cockney of East London into a child of God. Welcome, Peter. Thank you. Now, tell me, are you a real cockney? The purists would say no, because being born during the Second World War, I was an evacuee baby. What does that mean? That means that pregnant mothers were sent out of London because obviously London was the prime target yeah. in the middle of 40s and to have their babies and the estates were opened up, uh, the wealthy people opened up the hospitals and so the baby was born several hundred miles away from London. When the baby and mother were right, they would come back again. So strictly speaking, for those purists that might be listening, <laughs> no, I'm not, but I've spent over 18 years in the East End of London and so obviously picked up a lot of the Cockney slang oh. and also brought up, of course, amongst a lot of Jews, which I mentioned before, but the Jews were amongst in London, which is also, if I look at it now in hindsight, it's probably part of that spiritual journey that I didn't realise it was a spiritual journey because um, Jews, and as we know, as we'll find out later on, the Sabbath is became very important. But in those days, of course, it was a Jewish Sabbath. Our Sabbath was a Sunday. So there was a, a contretemps there as well, as far as that's concerned. But for the purists, no. Strictly speaking, I was not born in the sound of bow bells, which is the criteria for being a Cockney. Ah. Oh. So where were you born then? Born in the county of Huntingdonshire in a place called Little Paxton. In a, it's a was, it's not there anymore, a big estate house there that was turned into a hospital. A lot of those during the war were turned into hospitals for uh, wounded people coming back, but also in this particular case, it was turned into a maternity home as well for mothers expecting. You mentioned earlier that um, you were christened in a particular place. Mum and Dad were married in a high church of England, which, as a matter of interest, from our terraced house kitchen window, which was a three-storey house, through a gap in the houses opposite, I could actually see the spire of the church where they were married, but I was also christened there in a high church of England. Uh, again, that would have been the start of a spiritual journey that God would have known about, but I certainly didn't have any idea as to what it was. And it was a long journey from then, and just briefly, that was a start. The next step was Sunday school and Cubs and Scouts, which was done in a congregation of church. I was confirmed in a low Church of England, not so a high Church of England. What's the difference? Because I don't understand any of that. A high Church of England is very much like the Catholic Church. They use all the paraphernalia that goes on in the Catholic Church. They use all the sniffy stuff and waving it around as far as that's concerned whereas the low church of England doesn't have any of that as far as that's concerned so and a lot of people might not even understand it's still around but I say the high, the high church is very catholic orientated as far as what it does so that was confirmation I guess I guess God was still taking me on a journey because I hadn't met my wife at that stage um, but eventually meeting my wife who was a catholic I got married in a Catholic church and then we both became Adventists quite later on after a, at least a 20 year search. So you went to Sunday school and um, confirmation. Then what was the next step in your journey um, as you were would growing have, up as a young man? Would have been joining the Air Force. I would imagine that was probably the, the, biggest, the biggest step. Um, very close to my mother, but I could see that I needed to move out. I'm very almost tied to mum's apron strings, unfortunately. I didn't need to move out and I had to make a life for myself. Mm. Um, and as it's turned out, with mum dying young, I would have been left looking after brother and sister. Not that I would have minded that, but I could see that I would have been the eldest. Mm. And a lot of people, young people may be watching this, have got to remember that the responsibility in those days, particularly when you've had a Victorian upbringing, the responsibility was on the eldest child, whether mm. it was a boy or a girl. And that was a leftover way back. Um, I'm a genealogist as well, so I study. In the 1800s, the oldest girl was expected to go into service to bring money home to look after the rest of the children. Mm. And the, the young girl of 16 or 17 would look after all her siblings, as far as that's concerned. So it was still there, even in my lifetime. Mm. So I realised that. And of course, 
got out of hand in it because what he was doing <clears throat> was bringing me and my future wife together at the same place. So where did you meet? We met at a place called Horton, uh, Royal Air Force Horton's base in Buckinghamshire, just out, about 40 mile outside of London as far as that's concerned. A large, a very large base. In fact, we had as many people on there as in the New Zealand Air Force, just on the one base. Mm. It was a massive base. What exactly were you doing in the Air Force? I was an electrician at that particular stage. Uh, okay. so that, and my wife was a, an admin clerk, worked in one of the offices. She also, because we had three different churches on our base, a Catholic church, a Presbyterian, an Anglican one. Um, admin staff were also moved in to work in the churches. And she ended up working in the Presbyterian church at one stage as well, which just happened to be opposite the Catholic church, which is where we actually got married. Okay. <laughs> so telling the story now, I'm beginning to realise that God's leading was absolutely phenomenal, but we had no clue. We never had a clue that we were being led as far as that's concerned, mm -hmm. even to even to moving out completely from the UK as well, was, was God's leading. There's no two ways about it. So how did you ask her to, to marry you? I eventually realised that this lady was something different and I asked her to marry me. And, but I also said to her, before you answer, I have a couple of questions. I would like to have children so we grow up with them because that happened, my parents being older parents. And I said, I'm thinking of emigrating to New Zealand. Okay. Barbara, what's your answer? When are we going? <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> when, oh, you said we're going, when are we going? I said, that wasn't the question. He said, oh yes, of course I'll marry you. And I thought, <laughs> anyway, later on I found out that talking in the, in the barrack blocks where they live, talking to a girl's friends of hers, she'd already made her mind up. She said, if Peter asked me to marry him, I will say yes. Oh, wow. <clears throat> so the next step of the journey is obviously coming to New Zealand? No, we had a son first, okay. we, after we got married, uh, and then we were... Trying to get here was quite traumatic, actually, as far as that's concerned. It wasn't as easy as a lot of people think it is, even though we're coming from a Commonwealth country. Um, we did have a scare. My wife, we had to have chest x-rays, and there was, they found a spot on her lung, so we had to have it again, and it wasn't there. So, But we were paying for it all the time, medicals and everything, travelling to New Zealand House. And we still weren't guaranteed of coming here as far as that's concerned, but eventually we did. We made it as far as that's concerned with very little. We had a son and I think we had about £400 between us and that was about it. So, Peter, what made you decide to come to New Zealand? We looked at Canada, mm -hmm. Australia, and at one stage I looked at Rhodesia, oh, which really? you would understand. Well, it's still part of, still belonged to until 1965, of course. Um, and we look, I, I looked at all of those and New Zealand and of course went to Australia House, Canada. Canada was too expensive. We didn't have the money to be able to survive in Canada. Mm. Australia was out and I'm glad it was because my wife was very scared of spiders and snakes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was it. But New Zealand looked very English mm. and of course it is, even where we're living here in Christchurch, they say it's more English than England, so as that's concerned. <laughs> and so looking at the New Zealand house films and all that, it looked very, very attractive. And when my wife, future wife saw it as well, she agreed that that really was the place to go. You mentioned earlier that it was um, also a pivotal point in your spiritual journey for both your wife and yourself. Because we got married in a Catholic church, I did that for two reasons. One was mainly for her and the other one was so that her dad would come and give her away. Unfortunately he didn't. We postponed the wedding for a while and it didn't happen. But I did that because that was what they wanted. Um, and then the conversation started as to, well, you're a Catholic, I'm a Church of England, can we both be right? So we decided that, okay, and I'm very, very fortunate that I had a wife that was ready to go on a journey with me and search for the truth. That's really what it boiled down to. Mm. There was no holding back as far as she was concerned. The funny side is that later on, uh, but much later on, um, we confided in each other that we decided that, what well, I, I think I'm right, I will show my wife. And my wife was saying, I think I'm right. What we didn't realise is most of it, we were both wrong, of course. So, <laughs> so it was, um, but that never, 
that never squashed any of the enthusiasm for searching. Mm -hmm. And so we started a search and we went, I think you name the churches, Christian churches, and we went everywhere as far as that's concerned. We halted at one stage in the Salvation Army. They were probably the most friendly and welcoming. But in our minds, we thought, there's something missing. Did we didn't you? know what it was at that stage. There's something missing. Mm -hmm. And you've got to remember, going back to my upbringing, thinking of something like the Sabbath wasn't even in the question because being brought up amongst Jews, that was their Sabbath and Sunday was our Sabbath as the Gentiles. And um, interesting enough, I did go out with the Jewish girls one stage as well, but that was stopped. Mum stopped that because you can't get married to a Gentile. Mm -hmm. Now, people might see that now as quite strange in the 21st century because we're supposed to be most enlightened, but it is still a reality. Gentiles don't marry Jews, and that's, that's what it was boiled down to. So this searching, you're searching for something, and I appreciate there's a lot of people today in modern day 21st century world are searching for something, but they really don't know what they're searching for. Mm -hmm. And we were in that same position. So I completely understand. If somebody's listening to this, don't give up. It's there. If you want it, the truth is there. But you've really got to want it. Mm. You've really got to say, no, Salvation Army, I'm sorry, but you don't have something, whatever it is. Okay, so Peter, you came out to New Zealand, and then what happened? You have to have a job to come to. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'd look through a lot of New Zealand magazines for a job as an automotive electrician, and I got a reply from somebody in Frankton Junction, which is just outside Hamilton, um, and they gave me a job. So I had a job to come to. So that, was, that got me onto New Zealand soil, as far as that's concerned. Um, I had to stay there two years as part of the agreement with the government, as far as that's concerned. But one day, somebody turned up in the garage where I was working in blue uniform. <laughs> and um, I looked at the uniform and went, um. I went home and told my wife and talked to her. She said, you want to go back in the Air Force, don't you? <laughs> Very perceptive wife. I said, yeah, I think I'm missing it. I'm really missing it. So long story short, I applied and um, I, they accepted me almost on the spot oh, wow. to join up and sign up. So, um, and actually got a trade above what I was in the Royal Air Force. I was an electrician there, which was a trade below the radio communications one, and they let me in as well. Oh. And so that started that journey. Remembering we were still on this spiritual journey as well at the same time and still trying to make our way in a new country mm. with very little to bless us. In the meantime, of course, um, we'd had another child, we had a daughter born in Hamilton. Um, so I was away for quite a few months on my own. Uh, and then eventually the whole family moved down to Wigram where I was. And I started my Air Force career. Uh, not forgetting in the back of our minds a wife and I tell her, we're still searching for something, aren't we? And so mm. we were. So once you get in the Air Force, of course, you start to move around and then things pop up, which they did in Blenheim, Woodburn, where we were, was this Daniel seminar, which was being held by the Adventist Church. How did you come across it? That was advertised, like the letterboxing that most of us, if you think letterboxing doesn't work, I'm sorry, but it does work. <laughs> does work. It may not work on the letterbox it's gone in, but I know for a fact that it can turn up in some strange places. Mm -hmm. And so we, we did the Daniel Seminar. Now on that, something that has always been in the back of my mind, not, I've not been exactly a, a good Bible reader. I'm not, I'm not saying I have in those days. But two books in the Bible were always in the back of my mind, Daniel and Revelation. So when a Daniel Seminar came up, I thought, we need to go and see this. Were <coughs> so you we saw hesitant? That. Sorry? Were you hesitant to go? Yes, because we were taking our children as well at that stage and we'd been trying to study on our own. Mm -hmm. the, we'd been studying the Plain Truth magazine for quite some time. Herbert Armstrong's organisation, that was one of the areas that we'd looked at. Um, and the Sabbath was mentioned in there, but it still didn't, it didn't register because this Jewish thing in the back of my mind wouldn't go away you know it was no no that's that can't be right that's Saturday's the Jewish Sabbath so the Daniel seminar was interesting but there was something happened that made the hairs on my back of my neck stand up and so for the next six years it just 
had lied dormant. We still had all the notes and we still looked at this Daniel. We enjoyed were you, it. Were you going to church during this time? No. Not at all? No, not at all. So and then a posting came up, so I ended up in Wellington. And not long before we were in Wellington, a revelation seminar came up. I thought, mm hmm, I wonder. And the children weren't with us then, of course, because they made their way. I thought, I said to my wife, that's that other book, isn't it? She said, what are we going to do? I said, I think we'll go. And the rest is history, of which we're talking about now. That was really the starting point, because then we realised that, hey, there's no such thing as a Jewish Sabbath. It's the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And as my good friend Walter Weith points out, the definitive article is there for a reason. It's not mm -hmm. a Sabbath, it's the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And suddenly the Jewish side of me thought, hmm. And so as we studied more, obviously what we did, we realised that the Sabbath had come in before there was even a Jew mentioned as far as that's concerned. But even now, it's that Jewish side of me is still there because it's part of my upbringing. So I was being, being in the East End of London, you know. So all went well. But there's an interesting story there. While we were at the seminar, the weeks went past and we were studying and we were studying. That was fine. And there must have been, there was a group of three. There was two girls and a boy. I think it was a brother and a sister and a friend. And there was about three others plus ourselves. And I remember this group of three when Pastor Rain Mulberg, wherever you are, if you're listening, thank you. When the Sabbath subject came up, we never saw these three again. As soon as that was mentioned as a study, it was a shame because after that, we were the only two eventually that ended up going for the last two seminars, I think, at the Lower Hutt Church. We were the only two left as far as that's concerned. All the others had, had disappeared. And, but it was the Sabbath. It was the Sabbath that brought us into the church as far as that's concerned because I couldn't refute it. It's in there and you can't dispute it as far as that's concerned, even though I'd been brought up as a Sunday keeper for, mm. for a long, long time. But the story there as well, and I don't want to upset anybody, but my wife being a Catholic really fought it right to the very end before getting baptised mm. because we now know that that upbringing of us as a Catholic was still niggling away in the back of her mind. Mm. I'd made my mind up. But on the Thursday before the Sabbath, she was still, and then suddenly it just clicked, just like that. Mm. She said, yes, and we got baptised together. Did you, during this time of discovering more Bible truth, did, did your, your relationship with Jesus become very personal? It started to, but there were other side effects like your children. Mm. Uh, and as earlier on in the piece there, our daughter actually was the first one in our family to get baptised. She got baptised in a Baptist church. I was very fortunate to ask to officiate as well, actually in the font with her. Um, but the children were still, what have mum and dad done? What, what is this? You know, and, mm. and I appreciate this happens and it still, ha it still happens with our children now. They still don't understand as far as that's concerned. It's a, mm. Because my son married a Catholic a very true Catholic, she's a very lovely lady, um, and my daughter married um, Sunday Keepers. And they both married into big families, which I, we're very grateful for, but the hesitancy was there. I mean, my son-in-law said to me, um, my mum and dad brought me up this way, all those people can't be wrong, can they? Mm. Well, our studies taught us, both my wife and I, that 2,000 years ago, the majority were wrong. Mm. And that always stays with me. I say, yes, but the majority weren't right back then, were they, when they crucified our Lord and Saviour? But the, the children still have this hesitancy, um, and particularly my daughter with the spirit of prophecy, that, that is a really hard one for her to get over, as far as that's concerned. It's a real, it's a large, it's not a fence, it's a large wall mm. that she has a job getting over. I have no problem with it at all. I've been blessed by the spirit of prophecy ever since we started reading. Great controversy in the desire of ages. So Peter, when you found these Bible truths, how did your life change? I was a teenager in the permissive 60s, as they call it. So I, had a I was a record collector. Uh, interestingly, vinyl was coming back in. I had a massive record collection as far as that concerned. That went en masse. 
That was one of the first things that we sold off and got rid of. The next biggest thing, my wife and I are both bookworms, mm -hmm. very, very avid readers. So our reading material changed. So boxes and boxes of novels and I had uh, Henry James, Neville Shute. I had all of Agatha Christie's books, all 72 volumes of them. They all went. We realised that even before I got into a lot more with Spirit Prophecy about what novels would do, we realised that they all had to go. Our reading material had to change because we were never going to we were never going to learn anymore. We realised that, and I've realised, and I think a lot of people do, when they get baptised, that is not the end of the journey. That's mm. the beginning of the journey. Mm. And so the beginning of the journey means you need to study that book on the table more. You need to realise that the spirit prophecy is there for a reason. Mm. So we started to edge those books out and bring the spirit prophecy books in. So that was changing as far as that's concerned. The language changed as well as far as that's concerned. Um, and so all of these changes were, and they don't happen overnight, um, we started to realise that diet was important. So we became vegetarians. Again, not overnight. Being an Englishman, of course, I was a tea drinker like no one's been. I mean, eight and ten cups of tea a day was quite normal. I was brought up on tea. So we realised that that weren't coffee drinkers, so that didn't matter, but the tea had to go. And for me, I was expecting withdrawal symptoms, and I got none. I was always looking over my shoulder thinking, I stopped tea just like that. I stopped smoking, just like that. I stopped drinking, just like that. But... How? How did you... Was it a... There were two items I couldn't do that with, though. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, that's great. Chocolate yeah. and cheese oh. were another. A whole new ball game. <laughs> All those others are gone, but the devil was saying, well, I'm going to get you to hang on to these two. Yeah. And it was only... Cheese went when we realised it was giving us headaches, both of us. We hadn't read what the Spirit Prophecy said, that it shouldn't pass our lips. We realised that health-wise, we'd wake up some mornings, we'd been out, there must have been some cheese in that meal yesterday. Why? You've got a headache? Yeah, I've got a splendid headache. Out went the cheese. The chocolate was a bit more of a fight, unfortunately. But that, I mean, that was, it was minor compared to all the other things that had just put aside. How did God give you the victory over that? I think... When I realised that our daughter was virtually addicted to chocolate, she'd inherited it from her mum and dad because we were both chocolate people, my wife and I. And our daughter inherited it. It had come through the blood. And it somehow she had an awful job of stopping chocolate. And we realised it's an addiction. So somehow it, we've got to stop. Mm. Um, and gradually, obviously, gradually we did. But it was a bigger fight than all the other. It certainly was a bigger fight than the tea drinking. I mean, tea drinking was just like falling off a log. But this other one wouldn't... It took a while before it disappeared eventually. But it did. Um, mainly, I think, because of other, of other lifestyle changes. Mm -hmm. You know, because suddenly you're becoming a little bit more healthy. Uh, the brain is starting to understand some of the... You know, I mean... It's, there's 99% of that I still don't understand. But there are things that I do. Uh, something I haven't mentioned is I have had one revelation since becoming an Adventist, and that was the duality of the Bible. I read texts now that I would have never read before and looked and saying, that's talking about Christ. In the Old Testament, I'm reading it. And it suddenly, it must have been at 2 o'clock one morning, it suddenly come to me, Peter, the Bible is dual. It's talking about two different things. It's talking about their time and our time. And it's talking about Christ in the Old Testament. That's, that's who Isaiah is talking about. That's who Jeremiah is talking about. That's the only revelation I've had, but I really hold that close because not everybody has a revelation as far as that's concerned. And that was, that was my basic revelation. So I look at text now. The difference is made. I look at that in a whole new realm of what I didn't have at school. I did religious instruction at school, but we were told that that's the Old Testament, that's the New Testament. We were given a New Testament when we confirmed. The Old Testament's a history book, and we just studied all the battles and how many people got killed and all that sort of thing. The New Testament is for us. That's our dispensation. No, it isn't. It's one whole book. 
two-thirds of what Christ said comes from the Old Ah, the light went on. Suddenly you realise it has changed you, hasn't it? Yes, it has in a big way. Thank you so much for sharing your testimony with us today, Peter. Sometimes we are not always aware of how God leads in our lives. With Peter, God led him from the East End of London to his wife, New Zealand, and ultimately to his word. Maybe you are seeking for something more in life. I want to challenge you to open the Bible. God is still speaking, even today. <laughs>